Okay, so um, good afternoon. My name is Man Wan. I am the director of Washington State China Relations Council. Uh, we also have Norther, our uh, executive director. So thank you for joining us and then participating in this webinar on poverty eradication in China, reality versus uh, rhetoric. So um, if you follow China's news closely, uh, you may remember just a couple of weeks ago, um, China announced that with nine counties in Guizhou province being removed from the poverty county list, it has reached its goal of elimin uh, eliminating extreme poverty by the end of 2020. The campaign lifted close to 100 million population in 832 count uh, counties of the nation's 3,000 county out of poverty. However, uh, critics argue that China was able to achieve the goal because their poverty level was set too low and it hasn't addressed the increasing income gap between rural and urban areas, between the rich and the poor and across regions. Um, there are also concerns whether some populations within China may regress back to poverty due to end of certain government subsidies. So with many hanging questions, we're very glad to host this timely webinar with two experts who have lived and worked in China and have firsthand observations on the effectiveness of the Chinese uh, government's poverty alleviation program. Um, I'll introduce our moderator, Daniel Tim Klingborn first, and then Daniel will introduce our speaker, Matthew Chitlet. Um, before I hand it over to Daniel, uh, allow me to briefly introduce our organization, the Washington State China Relations Council, if you're not familiar with us. Founded in 1979, we are the oldest state-level nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote stronger trade, commercial, educational, and cultural exchanges between Washington State and China. We are a membership organization which incorporates businesses, government agencies, cultural and educational entities, as well as individuals with an interest in China. Our activities include producing educational programs, uh, managing uh, uh, visiting delegations from China, uh, consulting with the state and local governments on their relations with China, and working with uh, the local Chinese community. In the spring this year, we established our sister organization, Washington State China Relations Fund, um, a 501c3 charitable organization to support WCRC's educational and cultural programs. Uh, we were able to use this organization's charitable status to help import PPEs for the city of Seattle and the state of Washington, um, and to support donating meals to frontline workers through a program called Food with Love. 2020 has been a challenging year for everyone, uh, punctuated by the coronavirus pandemic and the rapid deterioration in U.S.-China relations, uh, which his is lowest act since 1979. So to continue our 41-year legacy and important work, we ask you to consider joining us as a member or making a generous year-end donation to the Washington State China Relations Fund to support our educational and cultural programs like this and to build a strong community. So now let me introduce our moderator, Daniel Tim Claiborne. Um, Daniel, is an international development professional and a writer who has worked with nonprofits, philanthropic organizations, and the private sector on programs aimed at reducing poverty, enhancing equity, and promoting sustainable development in emerging economies across Asia, Africa, and the Americas. He currently works for BSR, a global nonprofit and sustainability consulting firm. Um, he has spent over four years living and working in China including at the China Foundation for Poverty Alleviation and the Yale Young Global Scholars Program, and currently serves on the board of Oberlin Shanxi, a nonprofit that promotes education and deeper understanding between the US and Asia. Um, Daniel holds a BA from Oberlin College, an MA in Global Affairs from Uni Yale University, and an MFA in Creative Writing from the Program for Writers at Warren Wilson College. He's currently writing a novel about identity, uh, migration, and belonging set against the backdrop of contemporary U.S.-China relations and will be spending the next year in Taiwan as a Fulbright research scholar. So um, last, a couple uh, housekeeping issues. If you have questions for the speaker, 
please write them in the chat box and we'll address them after the moderated discussion. And also please make sure to mute yourself throughout the session um, unless you'd like to ask questions verbally in the QI8 session when you can turn on uh, your speaker. Um, so now, Daniel, over to you. Thanks so much for that introduction, Man. Uh, and thank you and Noor both for the opportunity to have this discussion today. I'm, I'm so honored and thrilled to be speaking with Matt Chidwood today. Um, so very briefly, I'll, I'll um, introduce Matt in a second, um, but just in terms of the flow for the program. So we'll have Matt um, speak for about uh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, to uh, give her his perspective on this very important issue. And then we'll go ahead and engage in some dialogue. I'll start with a few questions. Um, but as Man mentioned, we very, very much encourage any questions that you all have. So please feel free to, to write them in the chat and we'll go ahead and make sure um, those get answered. Um, so it is, it is my distinct pleasure, uh, really my delight to, to introduce Matt Chitwood. So Matt uh, recently returned from two years in the remote village of Bangdong in Yunnan province uh, as part of a fellowship with the Institute of Current World Affairs. It was there that he observed firsthand the drastic social and economic change in rural China that will be the subject of today's discussion. Prior to his fellowship, he developed, managed, and taught for study abroad programs, including CET, CIEE, as well as Where There Be Dragons. And he also worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the U.S. State Department's Critical Language Scholarship Program. Uh, Matt holds a dual, B, uh, dual MA in China, uh, China Studies and International Economics from Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS. Um, and he also completed the Graduate Certificate Program at the Hopkins Nanjing Center. Uh, he's written for many publications, including the Republic, Foreign Policy, as well as the American Interest. Uh, and he's currently working on a book uh, based on his fellowship research. Um, probably most impressive of all, which doesn't get mentioned on his CV, is that many months ago he accepted a uh, LinkedIn request from no other than me, a veritable stranger at that juncture. And uh, before the, even the vaguest notion of this talk came to fruition, and volunteered to share, generously share his experience on China and offer some advice to me. So I'm very indebted and grateful for, uh, for your friendship and, uh, and your expertise, Matt. Uh, so without any further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Matt Chitwood. Thank you, Daniel. Very kind introduction. Uh, great to connect with you. I'm going to share my screen here and we'll get going. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Thanks to the Washington State China Relations Council. It's a privilege to be here and share a, a very timely presentation when we arranged this maybe a month and a half, two months ago, uh, a while back. Uh, China still had poverty in its borders. And, and so it's been only since then uh, that that's been announced um, that China has eradicated poverty. And so what a timely discussion. Looking forward to this. Um, it was actually last Thursday uh, that President Xi Jinping announced officially that at the household level, poverty in China had been eradicated. He called this the largest and most vigorous battle in human history against poverty. Uh, this was a goal that actually Xi himself set back in 2013, and it became national policy in 2015. And so the question that we want to discuss today, I'm very much looking forward to your questions at the end of the presentation is, has China actually eradicated poverty? Uh, my short answer to that that I wrote in Foreign Affairs just two weeks ago was saying yes, and it sure has a long way to go still. Uh, I, I noted in that article that this campaign is neither a, a figment of government propaganda nor an unalloyed success. So what do I mean by that? That's what we're gonna pack, unpack today. We'll talk about the metrics of the campaign itself, the method and the aftermath as well. But before I dive into that, uh, I wanna introduce my friend Atong. He's the guy there who's getting the IV in his wrist um, and, and another friend, Li Guojun, uh, who's got the scissors and cotton ball <laughs> in his mouth, who's inserting the IV. Um, he learned how to do that on his cattle to take care of them, keep them healthy. Uh, these guys live in Bangdong. They were my neighbors there. And Atong is actually one who helped me uh, fix up the old mud walled house that became home for two years there. You can see him patching the holes in the roof there so the, <laughs> the snakes and the chickens and the rats couldn't get in. Um, 
he became a very good friend. I remember sitting with him in his brand new home uh, one day. Uh, the government had given him money and he was able to tear down his earth walled structure like this and build a completely brand new structure, concrete, two stories, block structure. And we sat in his little sitting room there uh, with, with the tiles, I guess that you can see better here, tiled floor, um, you know, drink, uh, corn liquor, you can see uh, Paul, it's uh, steeping with some, some uh, things in the background. I think some wasps maybe was what he was steeping it in and sitting there and talking with him. And uh, what he told me was three years ago, and I quote this, uh, three years ago, we didn't have these nice houses. Now we have good places to live and healthcare, he told me. Uh, our living standard isn't so high, but we can eat meat every day. There's been a huge transformation that's taken place uh, across China, uh, rural China, in villages just like Bandung all across China, and in lives just like Atong, uh, just like his life. Uh, now, these forces of tra transformation didn't just start with the poverty eradication campaign. They've been going on for 40 years, uh, ever since economic reforms, uh, reform and opening up um, 40 years ago, started with uh, farmers like Atong being able to keep a certain amount of grain above state quotas um, so that as a villager told me people were quote no longer lazy to work uh, but worked from sunrise to sundown. Started with migrant laborers like Atong being able to go out and work in factories as China joined the WTO became the factory of the world, uh, continued as infrastructure developed, continued as places like Bangdong village started being able to produce cash crops because there were people on the wealthy East Coast uh, able to and willing to pay premiums for things like tea that they produce in Bangdong village. And they were willing to pay 10 times more for tea from Bangdong than a village 20 kilometers away that didn't have as good of climate or soil uh, then produced a much more bitter tea. Um, I mentioned the infrastructure just to note in Yunnan province, because uh, I find this remarkable, 12 years ago, 40% uh, of the population didn't have direct access to paved roads. So these changes over time have been very, very incremental. Uh, there was a huge uh, push for expansion of social welfare policy uh, about 15 years ago under the, the WHO One administration. And then most recently, this poverty eradication campaign that over the last eight years, according to the government's figures, has lifted uh, almost one million people out of poverty. So this has been the in incremental progression of Atong's life getting to a point where now he has a brand new house and he says, I can eat meat every day. So these are remarkable uh, transformations that have taken place uh, in his lifetime. So it's this campaign, this poverty eradication campaign, uh, that is the reason that uh, Atong has this card hanging on his front door that declares him to be an impoverished household. Uh, so this, this card records data on his family, how many people in his family, the amount of arable land that they have, his family's annual income, the cause of their poverty, uh, lacks skills, uh, and uh, let's see, this one is a nine-point plan to get him out of poverty. Uh, it also has his photograph there, and on the back, it's got a red thumbprint making this official. So this card is the fruit of a massive mobilization of resources across China to get every single rural household in their database, in the, the government's database to record all of this data, determine who is impoverished, uh, and the people who are impoverished get them out of poverty. This is the government's targeted poverty alleviation campaign. Uh, they sent hundreds of thousands of, of government officials all over China to do this and this, whether they got everyone out of poverty or not, this it alone was a feat in and of itself, uh, getting every household in this database. Um, so what were the metrics of this, uh, of, of this whole campaign? Uh, well, it's a very convenient, uh, very uh, propaganda friendly uh, campaign called the one, two, three 
uh, campaign or one, two, three metrics. Uh, this is how they measure poverty. So one is, is one uh, income or one poverty, uh, one poverty line. Uh, so this line, uh, this is important to note. This line is talking only about extreme rural poverty. So it doesn't address rural, uh, urban poverty at all. And it's, and it's in a line that uh, in 2011, uh, was a dollar ninety USD per day. Uh, China's line has risen, uh, adjusting for inflation, so that today uh, it's about four thousand RMB. Um, and when you adjust for purchasing power parity, it's about two dollars and sixty cents uh, per day. Uh, this is well above the World Bank's poverty line. There are some people that argue um, that, that China's standard is lower. Uh, I'm happy to go into that in more detail in Q&A if that's of interest to people, but let me just say, uh, and The Economist has a great explainer on this, that uh, China's poverty line is well above the World Bank's standard uh, of $1.90 per day. Uh, and that means that uh, uh, according to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, by 2030, uh, countries who bought in this, bought into the sustainable development goals, were trying to eradicate poverty uh, by 2030. Well, China has accomplished that already, 10 years early, uh, at a poverty line higher than uh, the World Bank. So it, it is uh, an accomplishment in that regard. Um, also, in addition to that poverty line, China has a more comprehensive definition of poverty that includes the liang bu chou, two no worries, which are sufficient food and clothing, and then san bao zhang, having three guarantees of safe housing, basic medical care, and compulsory education. So those are the three standards by which China has measured poverty in this campaign. Um, so when I'm sitting with Ah Tsong in his new house, that house is part of this campaign to have safe housing. Uh, he got 50,000 renminbi of free money uh, to tear down his old mud walled house and build the new one. That's about seven or 8,000 USD in free money. And then another seven or 8,000 USD uh, of no or low interest loans. Uh, and then he, he saved on that by doing the work himself because uh, he knows how to do construction. He's been a migrant laborer. Uh, and once he builds his house, he can help his buddy build his house uh, and swap labor for labor, uh, save some money in that. Uh, now, just to put things in a little bit of context, uh, that, that house money that they got, let me say two things. One, um, these metrics are consistent across uh, all, all across China, um, but localization, uh, if anyone who knows China policy, uh, localization of policies is very important. And so um, in the county where I lived, they would get this 50,000 uh, renminbi of free money uh, if they qualified. Uh, the next county over, uh, and that 50,000 was specific to house renovations. The next county over, uh, each household got 20,000 renminbi, and that was for whatever they wanted, uh, cash transfer, non-conditional non cash transfer. To put the 50,000 in context, uh, if we're talking about a poverty line of 4,000 renminbi per person per year, think how much that 50,000 is to you. That's like 12 annual, 12 times your annual salary. You know, imagine if, uh, if the U.S. government took your annual salary and gave you 12 times that uh, into your pocket to rebuild your house uh, or five times that to do whatever you want with. This is, this is a remarkable amount of money and a huge uh, bolstering to these people's quality of life. Of course, that takes money to give free money. So here's a look at uh, the amount of money that since this became official policy in 2015, the amount of money that the central government uh, has allocated to this has just gone up incrementally every year, 20 billion more, 20 billion more, 20 billion more consistently through the year 2020 that had, uh, I think, 20.6 billion USD allocated that. I, I may be off on my numbers, but um, a, a large number earmarked uh, for 2020. So it's taken <clears throat> a lot of money and the numbers have also gone dramatically down. So you can see in 2012, about 100 million people, according to those metrics, in poverty. And 2020, as we said last Thursday, announced that there are officially zero people in poverty. Now, uh, the people who are in their new homes, 
they attribute this uh, directly to the Chinese Communist Party uh, and, and more specifically to Xi Jinping. He's essentially the poster child. This is in my friend, Brother Leo's kitchen in the village. Uh, she is essentially the poster child, of course, of the Communist Party and very much of this poverty eradication campaign because he was the first one to make it a concrete goal uh, to do this by 2020. Uh, and so there is a very high degree of satisfaction in rural low-income areas for uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Harvard Ash Center came out with a report this summer uh, based on almost two decades of surveys that they've done with 31,000 people. Uh, and the, the result of those surveys, what they're surveying is CCP, uh, Chinese Communist Party resilience. So how has this authoritarian party stayed in power so long? Do, are people pleased with it or not? And what they found in the, their latest survey that uh, people had the greatest satisfaction than they've had in any former survey. Um, and, and even more so in inland, low income areas, which is exactly the type of area that I was based for two years. Um, so the result is that uh, people are very uh, pleased uh, with the Communist Party's uh, performance uh, on this, uh, very pleased with Xi uh, specifically. Uh, and you better believe that this is gonna be a, a uh, there's gonna be a media blitz around this from now, uh, well until next year, 2021, which is the Chinese Communist Party's 100th birthday. Uh, and so you're gonna hear this over and over because again, China has done, has accomplished this United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 10 years early, has eradicated poverty. This is remarkable, this is remarkable. And something that only the Chinese Communist Party could accomplish is what we'll hear over and over, uh, essentially undergirding uh, the party's legitimacy. Um, and I would say that this is not just empty Chinese propaganda, although there is plenty of Chinese propaganda all over the countryside promoting this. This is Tuoping Zheng Se Hao, Dang En Wang Bu Liao. So the uh, poverty alleviation policy is good, and uh, the goodness of the party we will not forget. Um, people do attribute this directly to the party. Uh, and like I said, my neighbors in Bangdong, they're living their best lives now. Uh, their lives are dramatically improved from, from 10, even five years ago. And they attribute that directly uh, to the party. Uh, so those are people like Atong uh, and Brother Leo, who are helping me build a bathroom here. Uh, people like my neighbor, uh, Mr. Lee, and the kids who would come over and ride in the wheelbarrow every day. Uh, this is Grandma Lee, who uh, picks tea, helps harvest tea uh, for her family. Uh, these people are living their best lives uh, every day. And people have uh, better access to health care. This girl has better access to education. And people have these new homes and road access uh, for the first time. So I celebrate with my neighbors in Bangdong um, the results uh, of this campaign so far. Uh, I also recognize that life is very vulnerable for these uh, people still. The 100 million who have been lifted out of poverty officially, um, it's not an unalloyed success, as I wrote in, in Foreign Affairs. China still has a poverty problem. Uh, the 100 million people lifted out of poverty are still teetering right at that line of, of extreme poverty. Uh, I think the survey last year said uh, from the, the party officially said about 5 million are still in poverty as of last year and 5 million are still teetering on that line. So roughly 10 million. Um, obviously the 5 million in poverty are gone now. How many are teetering on poverty? You know, probably the official number is 5 million. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, the bar of 4,000 renminbi per person per year is incredibly low incredibly low. Just to put that in context, um, uh, you know, rich, rich kids in Beijing, they pay that much. It's, it works out to be a little over 300 renminbi per month. Rich kids in Beijing pay that per hour for English tutoring or standardized test training. Um, or to put it in context of Bangdong, where I lived, if you wanted to get a bowl of mi xian, the rice noodles uh, with some, some stewed meat in there, it cost you 15 renminbi per bowl. You know, you could get 20 plus bowls of that per month if you're living at this 4,000 renminbi amount per month. So this is a very, very low bar. It's something 
it's a start for China and China has a, a massive amount of people. Uh, but let's not forget uh, when China says it's eradicated poverty, uh, it's only extreme rural poverty and at a very, very low bar. Um, and, and issues continue uh, with uh, the other dimensions that are provided in, in this campaign. Uh, access to education, um, you can build all the infrastructure you want, but if, if you, you may have the hardware, but if you don't have the software in a school of, of teachers and good teachers and high quality education, um, you're still going to run into education uh, issues. Healthcare, you can build all the clinics or hospitals you want, but if you don't have uh, good doctors to provide the service that you need in those facilities, uh, you run into significant issues. So life is much better, but it's still very, very difficult, still very, very vulnerable. Um, we can understand how neighbors like Li Guojun in the blue hat, he's actually the one that did IV, the IV for Atong in that initial picture. We can understand that he's happy that his life is better, uh, that he's grateful to the party, because um, every little bit makes a big difference, but we can also understand that his life is still teetering on, on vulnerability. So there are challenges ahead. Um, that uh, I'm going to come back to that photo. <laughs> there are challenges ahead uh, as as we look to you know China moving forward to a, a moderately prosperous society, and, and the biggest is sustainability. So now you have a mass of people, 100 million people uh, more, who are dependent on the government for these expanded welfare programs. Um, the only way to continue that is for the is for the government to continue to have these resources that they're providing to keep people uh, above that poverty line. Uh, ideally, job creation does that. Uh, but job creation is really hard, especially in these areas where you have an uneducated labor force. You have, uh, you know, most the majority of people are Ill illiterate um, or, ha you know, have a, my neighbor Lee had a third grade education. So what do you, what do, you do with that? Um, you know, not everyone is like this cute, long thing, cute young thing in a rural area that I ran into. She's live broadcasting, you know, using modern technology to sell these pomegranates to rich people on the East Coast. She's explaining what they are, how to eat them. She's going to do okay. Uh, but your typical farmer, uh, like in Bangdong Village where I live, they're not going to be able to access uh, those markets like that through uh, these kinds of technology. Uh, as one party official told me, it's a sisyang wunti, it's a mindset issue. You can't take an uneducated person and just turn them into an entrepreneur uh, like this. So there's definitely a, a reliance, uh, a, a dependence that continues uh, for uh, the majority of, of these people who have been lifted out of poverty. Uh, other challenges ahead, um, rising labor costs. So a huge uh, component of you know, people's livelihoods getting better has been economic opportunity uh, in construction or factories elsewhere in China. Uh, those numbers are going down. They're, they're running out of houses to build and roads to build. Uh, factories are, are, are rages, wages are starting to rise. And so factories are, are moving elsewhere. Uh, the US-China trade war certainly didn't help. And so supply chains are, are considering moving elsewhere. All of these things affect, you know, China as a whole, uh, but they affect people like Liu Baohong. Uh, he is from the village that was 20 kilometers away with very bad tea. Uh, and so he has two options, one subsistence farming in his village uh, or uh, go to the cities for jobs. But those jobs are starting to dry out, uh, dry up. And so that's a, a huge challenge that China is facing uh, in, in the future. Uh, Scott Rosell has written a, a new book, Invisible China. Um, that identifies this uh, at length. Uh, excellent, excellent read, uh, talking about rising wages and the underinvestment in human capital that's, that China has had uh, over decades, underinvestment in education, uh, that's going to leave China stuck in the middle income trap unless there are uh, significant changes uh, in policy in the near future. Um, so what's next? Uh, China is turning its, its sights uh, away from this poverty eradication campaign, which has dealt exclusively with absolute poverty, very, very extreme low levels of poverty. They're starting even already to talk about turning their sights to relative poverty. Even when uh, General Secretary Xi announced 
eradication of poverty, he said, uh, we, we're not done. Uh, we can't stop. We have to keep uh, pressing forward um, uh, because there are a lot of, uh, well, not his words, but my words are a lot of people was still very little. So lots of work ahead uh, and you better believe uh, and, and just to mention as well, other, other obstacles in the equation, including her, uh, HUCO, uh, household registration issues, land use issues. I can talk about these uh, in, in more depth in Q&A if you'd like. Um, Underinvestment education, rising debt that China has 15 trillion in the last four years um, that has boosted a lot of growth, uh, but at some point that has to stop. Uh, and uh, demographic changes where you have a shrinking workforce and a, a ballooning uh, elderly population. Um, so challenges that China is facing, you better believe that, that things like the trade war are at the front of its mind, uh, trying to uh, s seal the deal on RCEP, the, the largest free trade agreement in, in the world, uh, that's a regional one in Asia, uh, the, what is it, CPTTP, uh, Trade Agreement, Trans-Pacific Partnership, that you better believe that these are at, at the forefront of China's mind uh, because they need to keep economic growth going because it affects everyone in China, including those at the very bottom. Why does China care about the rural population? Uh, very important demographic in terms of uh, stability, uh, not just a mandate of socialism, but I think party legitimacy and stability as well. Uh, party official in the village told me uh, China doesn't worry about the people in the cities. They've got strong enough surveillance there, but they worry about the people in the villages who are dispersed and just don't have that much to lose. So uh, with that, I will, I will stop there. This is Atong and his family. Uh, this was at New Year's. They're very happy. His sister's married an accountant from the city. His parents are better off now than they've ever been in their, their 70 years of life. So I celebrate with them and uh, the, the victory over poverty, uh, but I'm very quick to recognize uh, there's a whole lot of work that China has ahead. And I'll leave it at that. Looking forward to your questions. Thanks so much for that, Matt. Uh, incredibly informative uh, and, and really fascinating discussion. Thank you. Um, we, we really uh, encourage anyone to start using the chat to post any questions. I know we've got a couple already. Uh, I'll just uh, get us started, give you a second to catch your breath a little, you know, for just a, just a moment, Matt. Uh, but I, I think many of us uh, here are you know, very interested in the dynamics of, of kind of the, the segmentation between rural and urban China. And I think oftentimes when we think about rural development, it kind of comes hand in hand with this notion of urbanization. Uh, I think many of us are familiar with, with the, the idea of uh, buildings being marked, uh, hutongs paved over, uh, more recently, uh, provincial, governments, provincial governments giving a name to this idea of raising villages in the name of rural revitalization, uh, this idea of village mergers or hutong being cute. Um, this is sort of a, a very hot, I think, on the minds of uh, a lot. Uh, and I think it's very interesting that uh, you mentioned that the general sentiment, of course, around rural development, certainly in Bangdong, but as well as the survey results that have borne out from the Harvard Ash Center, have been largely positive in response to a lot of these changes. I was curious if you can speak a little bit to how the degree to which raising, uh, improving livelihoods, as well as kind of reviving the countryside can go hand in hand with uh, sort of positive outcomes and what are some of the potential downsides and are people talking about the very real consequences of maybe some of the things that are lost in this transformation as well? Yeah, um, so relocation has been a central part of this poverty uh, eradication campaign. There have been about 10 million uh, households that have been moved from remote villages to more concentrated uh, housing villages. Let me see. I, I think I'm sorry. I've got a, so here's an example of one. I mean, this is in the middle of nowhere. This is on the Nujiang River up in the northwest corner of Yunnan province. They built this, you know, massive apartment complex essentially uh, here, moved people down from the mountains from their, from their traditional homes and, and traditional uh, ways of life. Um, I'm not actually sentimental uh, about uh, culture in terms of you know, these old mud walled houses. Now I lived in one, I loved it. I thought it was really cool. Uh, but at the same time, I totally get that, that my neighbors in Bangdong, they don't want to live in one of those. They, they all uh, heckled me for living there because they thought it was dirty and awful and they loved their new modern 
homes that the government had provided for them. So uh, I don't get sentimental uh, about cultural preservation in, in that regard. Uh, I think where I do get sentimental is where there becomes a, a conflict of interest in terms of self-determination where, and let me see if I can find <clears throat> another photo. Uh, so this, this, uh, this family, this is the, the chief in a village of a Wa tribe. They call the Wa, the, uh, they, they call this village where they live the last primitive tribal village in China. Uh, and it's incredible, look how picturesque this is. The government came in and saw, oh, this is amazing. This would be great for tourism. And so what they did, essentially, the government, oh, I don't think I have a photo of the village that the government built, but the government built an entire new village elsewhere and uh, moved everyone to that village. I will say not forcibly, <clears throat> uh, but as one villager told me, the government has ways to uh, strongly encourage you to move elsewhere, to do to have you do what you want. So no one used the term forcibly, uh, which I noted, uh, but they did suggest that um, maybe there were some underhanded dealings in the government convincing people to move there. So now this is uh, essentially empty or these are all used as shops or guest houses, um, which, is, which is great in some ways, you know, the idea is that this provides tourism income to the households there. But the problem that I found as I talked to people in this village, as I talked to, to like, uh, as I talked to his son, the actual acting village chief, um, was that um, people had no self-determination, essentially, to choose to, to stay in their housing, um, you know, essentially forced to, to move elsewhere. And I found this to be the case uh, actually all over the province in different situations that I would talk to people where uh, there were government interests or development companies interests who those interests the development companies and the government those interests were often aligned and so the government would come in and make decisions uh, for for these people without any amount of self-determination uh, as as one villager in this village told me you know they already had uh, essentially the road map planned out for their plan and there was no invitation for input into that. And so I found that to be um, upsetting because they, yeah, they had no say in, in their future, um, which is too bad as well because had they been invited in, there were two blunders uh, with this village uh, where the brand new village that the government built, they built it down the hill from this village. And this lady told me, this wa, this wa woman was like, you know, in our culture, you can't move downhill. It's like, a, it's like degrading. You can only move uphill. So had they been invited into the conversation, you know, the government wouldn't have built this entire village compound down there and wasted resources. When the government built the second village that they essentially did force everyone to move into, it was up higher in the hill, but it didn't take into account the Wa custom. So for example, in this photo, you can see that fire pit in the middle. That's central uh, to their social <clears throat> life. Uh, they did not take into account the sleeping arrangements where the elderly sleep next to this pole because that represents, uh, and, and forgive me, I, I'm going to simplify this, uh, but you know that represents uh, um, honor to the ancestors, honor to the elderly, and uh, those sleeping customs were were not taken into account in these new housing structures. Um, so there's just a, in terms of cultural preservation then, um, I found in this village, you know, big money comes in to try to develop this. You can't actually save culture by selling it. And I found it very challenging that there was basically no amount of self-determination allowed for these people to have a say in their future, to have a say in what's best for their community. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we've got a couple questions about, uh, about land reform issues as well as the hotel registration system and how they may or may not contribute to loss of financial stability. And sort of hand in hand with that, I'll, I'll add another question from the chat here as well is, is this, is either the inability to, to improve on some of those critical reforms, uh, land use as well as hotel reforms, uh, coupled with this idea of in increasing development in the rural areas, changing the wave that we've experienced in, in the, over the last many decades of migrant workers moving to, to metropolitan cities, is that in some way staunching that flow and perhaps even reversing it? 
um, yeah, I mean, these are these are two areas, uh, especially HUCO. There's there's been a lot of talk about HUCO reform, and that talk has been talking for a long, long, long time, uh, and not much um, progress made on that. There has been change in terms of labor mo mobility, whereas in the 90s, where my my neighbors, the the now mayor of Bangdong Village, he was 15. You know, he runs away from home to go wash bowls in a noodle shop down in Guangzhou. Uh, that sort of labor mobility, uh, actually not legal, you know, at, at that time, whereas now uh, completely legal. So, you know, there, there are shifts in that, but, you know, in terms of HUCO, the, the biggest issue right now is that um, for, you know, I had that photo of the migrant laborer earlier, um, you know, when he goes out to work, if he has an accident, uh, he, he can't go get medical services uh, based on his huko, he has to get medical services in in his province uh, of Yunnan. So if you know he's laboring on the east coast, he's in big trouble. Uh, he's he's gonna have to pay for that himself, uh, or he can't get schooling for his daughter. He has a three year old daughter that lives at home with his grandparents. His wife works in the provincial capital in a cafe, um, and you know when she's old enough for school, she's not gonna be able to get uh, school over there. So uh, that's a challenge. Land, land use, uh, the two, one, one big issue with that is just that this is the, the biggest asset of rural people is their land, um, but they don't have a way to monetize that uh, right now. Uh, now, there actually are efforts being made. Um, my like first month in the village, they were doing a census around the village, going around getting everyone's uh, information, name card, and also like the, the plot points of their property to finally get like their property established uh, and then have public discussion if there's any controversy of, you know, their land versus our land um, to get them <laughs> in the system. And they said that uh, then the bank would start allowing people to borrow against their land. So it's in the works, but that's been a huge barrier, at least up to this point. Uh, I spoke with uh, uh, Director Li Ping, he's with Landesa that does land, uh, land use work globally. He's the head of the China program. And he told me there's actually been a lot of progress uh, in the last decade on, on land use reform, on laws around that. Now the biggest issue is that um, still closing uh, some of the loop on the laws, some vague wording, and the biggest issue anymore is actually just enforcement of the good laws that they have on the books. Um, so currently more of an enforcement issue uh, than anything else. Great, uh, very helpful. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we, we had a question on uh, the targeting, this targeted property programs often involves sending cadre, cadres and officials in work teams to the villages from outside to implement some of these programs. Can you speak a little bit about the role of outside officials uh, versus local leadership in the implementation of poverty alleviation, as well as more generally about the role of, of work teams with local and village leaders and communities? Yeah, so I saw a couple different iterations. So at, at the lowest level, or, or at least initially, it was the survey work, you know, so in 2015, all all of these, and maybe later, all of these officials going out to rural areas to get everyone in the system. Um, so that, that was the first. Would be on that card that you saw, like Ah Tong was hanging on his front door. And that caseworker was responsible for checking in regularly uh, with that household to make sure that they were making progress on their poverty uh, uh, elimination plans. Um, so that was one. Um, two, you had um, a party official assigned to every single impoverished household. And that party official was responsible at the end of the day for getting that, that household net help generate jobs or income, you know, not just give them money. I think theoretically that was the deal. Um, you know, help use their networks to help them sell their leftover tea crop, for example. Um, you know, and I, I saw people visiting, gifting oil. 
uh, or other important dimension of target, targeted poverty eradication campaign. Um, and then you, you had in coming through to see how the progress was being made. Because over the course of these five years, you have you know, counties early on that are saying, hey, we've done it, We're, we've, we've accomplished our goal you know, early. Um, I actually saw inspection. Teams from uh, to inspect villages so that there would be conflict of interest. You know, they would do the inspections, give them feedback uh, in preparation for the official final inspections from central government. So you had very, uh, se yeah, several inter iterations of different types of party officials uh, being involved in inspection, monitoring, and evaluation uh, throughout the campaign. You're kind of following up on that and thinking about some of the, the, the work of party officials, did you experience any of the, the downsides of the campaign? There's been a little talk in the chat about the idea of because some of the work that may necessarily have been done at the grassroots level is being superseded or, or implemented on behalf of party officials. Has this caused disruption or put pressure on local grassroots efforts in any way? Uh, as well as a kind of a, a follow-on question, which is, are there those, are there individuals in that population generally this ideologically uh, have any, uh, any have any sway in traditional Chinese culture in terms of pushback or uh, adherence or whether or not they're able to receive support, um, if that's not something that's of interest. Yeah, uh, so speaking to the grassroots efforts, you know, th this so, campaign was such a large mobilization of resources. Uh, I think uh, in good faith, well, the party was very interested and very open to anyone and everyone getting involved in it and work. not just uh, open to, but expected, um, especially everyone within the very expansive party state system, you know, so we're not talking just cadres, but we're talking university teachers and, you know, cause that's the state system and we're talking uh, medical workers. That's the state system. Um, you know, tax auditors, <laughs> that's the state system. So they're all involved in this in, in one way or another. Um, Private companies, uh, you know, they can send their executives to one of these tourism villages to help support that. And they did. Uh, they garnered some favor with local officials doing that. Alibaba, you know, uh, trying to work with Taobao villages. And I, you know, I have other opinions on the success or lack thereof of Taobao villages. But, um, you know, trying to incorporate technology and, and whatnot in, into these. So everyone's trying to get involved. So... I don't know that I, I didn't see examples uh, of grassroots efforts getting squeezed out. Um, probably what the, com my best guess, what the complaint would be was um, what I was saying earlier about self-determination. Maybe these grassroots efforts have a, have a better idea of what the locals want done and what's good for them. And yeah, you have higher level officials that have these six metrics uh, and have the county level edicts of how they're supposed to implement it and their promotion depends entirely on their performance uh, against these metrics. And so um, they're, yeah, certainly more interested in, in promotion or just keeping their job uh, as opposed to letting these grassroots efforts do their thing if they were conflicting. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have specific examples of, of when those conflicted. Uh, as to your, your second point about uh, people being uninterested or unwilling to work, there were cases of that even in the village where I was. And, and an example I've given in previous talks is uh, a neighbor who, he has two elderly parents who are unable to work. Uh, he has two kids who are in school and he has a wife who has mental health issues and unable to work. He himself is an alcoholic. And so he doesn't work. He's never uh, been able to, to hold a job. So he's at that very, very bare minimum where the government gives him quarterly payments to get him up to that extreme poverty threshold. You know, and I would talk to people in the village, you know, what do we, what do, we do uh, with this? Uh, I mean, the long-term game, I think the government's help hoping that his kids get educated and they're the ones who 
support him in, in the long run. But that's a that's a long play, right? Because those kids are about uh, nine and six years old, something like that. So how do we how do we address that? People in the village definitely saw it as unfair that he would you know not work at all and just drink all day and and get money for that. At the same time, they also pragmatically recognized he has a terrible life and he's he's very poor he's much worse off than his neighbors and so you know the the government is fixing up his house for him teaching trying to teach him how to maintain his house and sweep and and do some pretty basic things um and so they there's a little bit of resentment but uh, certainly not envy in that regard Helpful to hear. Um, I think also thinking about the relative differences between how populations get segmented within this large classification of poverty. Uh, one really interesting question that came in was related to uh, if there has been any differences related to gender with respect to either opportunities or the effectiveness of this campaign relative to men or boys versus women and girls. Um, and how have these relative populations been able to experience newfound financial position, education, as well as some of the other knock-on effects of this poverty eradication? That's a great question, and I don't know that I have a, a good answer to it. Um, I haven't looked at studies specifically or around any of this, so it would just be anecdotal. Um, certainly, with regard to gender and education, um, you know, it, it was equally available uh, to the, the kids in the village where I was living, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, in terms of expectations, there still is very much a, a traditional mindset around gender roles in, in the village. Um, and you had a lot of uh, girls who were... Um, yeah, just their their plan was to get through the basic education and then to uh, be a wife in the home, have kids, you know, be uh, work work the land, um, but but stay around there in the village, uh, not wanting to go out to work. <clears throat> um, I actually visited uh, actually Li Baohong, Jiang uh, village, uh, about twenty kilometers away. Again, the place with the the very bad tea. Uh, I went to visit one time, and there was a wedding. And I, I uh, started speaking with the groom, uh, who was 23, was speaking with the bride there on, in, you know, lots of makeup and a, a beautiful red gown. And, you know, talking like peers, I'm, with, I'm 38, so we were speaking like peers and come to find out she's 15 years old. And they're getting married. Now, uh, technically, that's against the law in China, but, you know, in terms of customs, uh, when you're in the middle of nowhere, uh, that's a, another story. So that that was a surprise to me. Um, but she had she had gotten through, uh, you know, the education system, um, what was of, of interest or required for her, um, and then was yeah stepping into a, a much more traditional gender role. So unfortunately, yeah, I I don't have good numbers on on studies of how that's playing out specific to this campaign though. Okay, no problem at all. Uh, cognizant of time, so I, I think we'll just have time for a couple more questions uh, before things start to wrap up a little bit. Um, one question we had is on uh, the sort of the, the general notion that, that many have that Chinese policies tend to focus on, on meeting goals, uh, not necessarily for sustaining goals, potentially. And so I know you mentioned a lot uh, about this renewed focus, Xi Jinping, on relative poverty, having moved on from absolute poverty. Uh, what's what's your thought in terms of, you know, the the sustainability of this of this continued poverty alleviation effort? Do you feel like it's going to be moving beyond this this sort of uh, one-time infusion and, and becoming something that really has uh, legs? And is there sort of incentives and motivations from the government to continue to keep this up in light of having already reached this SDG milestone? Yeah, I think there's there's huge motivation and recognition for the need to do so. <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, made made the news earlier this year when Premier Li Keqiang he said something to the effect of 600 million people in China still live on around a thousand renminbi per month, which is about 140 U.S. dollars. Uh, now it it turns out that's not an exact that's the quote, but that's not really the numbers. What 
he's averaging out incomes over the spread of those 600 million people. So a whole bunch make a whole lot less than that, and some make uh, a whole lot more than that. Uh, but the, the point is, uh, there's still a lot of poverty, and the, the rural urban gap is, is huge uh, and a, a tremendous issue that I think the, the party is mindful of. Um, if they'll be able to address it or not is another question because yeah, sustainability is, is a huge question that um, we don't know. I, I think the resolve and the party is there to continue to sustain. Again, they're motivated from a, a mandate of socialism and a party legitimacy standpoint. They're motivated to, and from a social stability standpoint, they're motiva motivated to keep these people um, better off and hopeful about the future. Uh, but that's dependent entirely upon resources being available to that. And so the question of when, you know, China find itself in trade wars uh, or, you know, low, lower economic growth than it's ever had before um, and changing demographics and ballooning debt. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a huge question of whether they'll be able to sustain this or not. So um, what I do know is there's a blueprint out there for the rural revitalization campaign. Uh, I think I have this at the end of my, my charts here too, if I can find it. Um, yeah, so the I, this is kind of the next big rural focused campaign that's coming on the heels of the poverty eradication campaign. In my sense, uh, it's very vague. Uh, no concrete terms yet. My sense that is that they're going to take all of the good things that were successful about the poverty eradication campaign, uh, the expanded social welfare programs, uh, um, and and sustain those, and then see how they can build upon those. So how can we uh, build even better healthcare, um, both hardware and software? Uh, better education, hardware, and software. Um, for this, you can see, you know, 2020, this is the year they're supposed to figure out the framework and the institutions for it. 2035, modern, modernize agriculture, rural areas. 2050, create strong agriculture, beautiful countryside, and well-off farmers. So these are nice things, uh, but very much in vague terms currently. So uh, I believe as the party works behind the scenes, they're uh, trying to solidify uh, these goals make them concrete, uh, and it's kind of the next big thing related to rural China, at least. Yep, exactly. And I know we're talking predominantly about rural, rural China and rural poverty. Uh, you, you made a, a great allusion, of course, to the widening gap in income inequality between rural and urban areas. Is there a relative sense of, of, you, uh, of metrics or standards you have relevant to earnings for a rural resident versus a poor urban resident, for example, and if there's any interventions that are being done, perhaps similar interventions done in, in urban areas to address that. Yeah, again, I don't have great numbers on that or a, or a way to put that uh, in context uh, at all. Uh, I, I, I would just say this, the relative poverty line uh, for rural areas is actually about 8,000 renminbi per person per year. Uh, so again, you know, this was extreme poverty line uh, sitting at around 4,000, and that's adjusted for inflation since it was set at 2,300 in 2010. Uh, and so uh, if you're, you know, if you want a, what some would say is a better measure uh, of poverty uh, to address rural areas specifically, that that, that relative poverty line would be a, a more useful measure. Um, yeah, I don't know what those numbers are for poverty line in, in urban areas are. I, I would just add what I mentioned earlier, Li Keqiang, you know, talking about the 600 million who live uh, on around 1,000 renminbi per person per year. Li Keqiang himself said, you know, that can't even, that barely covers rent in a mid-sized Chinese city. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have uh, another question, I think, more generally couched around the experience of living in a rural area. And I think it's, it's quite a unique uh, experience to have. And there are very few Americans who've had the opportunity to live in, in a rural village in China. And uh, this question is, is a little bit more explicitly focused on the surveillance data. Of course, as we know, it's being ramped up in, in urban areas over China. Uh, did you feel that within rural areas as well, that there was a strong emphasis on, on watching you? Did you feel safe, for instance? Did you uh, experience uh, 
kind of infringements and sort of personal movement and, and, and freedoms to that extent, uh, as well as I, for me, I think just also thinking more broadly, parts of your experience that were particularly resonant or any, any kind of fun anecdotes you'd like to share as we kind of close out this, uh, this really enlightening hour. Sure. Uh, so I'd, I'd first say, you know, surveillance, uh, a whole lot less in rural areas. You know, there were, there were some times where I'd, I would be riding around on my motorcycle in the middle of nowhere, come to some intersection and there's a camera there, you know, or in some very remote national park, you know, you're supposed to be off in the wild, uh, remote wilderness by yourself. And then there's this hick, hickey vision, you know, camera right there. It's like, what, what in the world? You can't, can't get away from it. Um, for me personally, uh, I actually experienced a great deal of uh, welcoming uh, and, and people in important uh, positions going to bat for me to make this experience possible for me. So I first and foremost uh, need to express my gratitude to those people who uh, were part of the party, um, who are the only reason that I could be where I was for two years. Because yeah, a, a full foreigner uh, in a rural area like that is kind of unheard of uh, and not not uh, often uh, we don't we don't get that opportunity it's a sensitive thing um, you know towards the end of my time there uh, I got a call from the 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 county government well the township government uh, they were located about 10 kilometers from Bangdong village and they invited me to visit them in Hecha to drink tea. And I, I was like, uh oh, because I knew that was a euphemism for get a talking to. Uh, and so I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I thought my two years had gone kind of without a hitch. I thought I had been a good Bangdong citizen. So I nervously went to go drink tea with them and sat down with them. And you know what? They just asked me what I thought about Bangdong, how they could produce better tea. Uh, how their marketing could be better, what I thought about the environment, how they could take better care of the environment, and they were genuinely seeking my opinion. So that was, that was a surprise because I was a little nervous about that interaction. So I, I experienced a great deal of freedom of movement uh, when I was there, and people were very open with me, very um, hospitable, very warm. Um, you know, there's always a worry when I, you know, when I would leave country, uh, visa issues, you know, would I have trouble getting back in again uh, or what? And the, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, it, it's odd to have someone like me in a place like that. And, and people had trouble making sense of it, you know, why I was there. Um, you know, some thought that I was there to teach English. Others thought uh, that I was a, a, <laughs> a reporter for Time Magazine. Some rumor got started because um, of a, a lie <laughs> that someone made to, as a cover for me. So I don't know. I, I was on a TV interview for a local TV station and they, they blasted out that I was a, as a Time Magazine writer. Um, you know, and, and other people invariably thought I was a spy. You know, why else would I be in a place like that. So I, I remember a conversation sitting down with the mayor of the village and I, you know, he said, hey, I have to ask you outright, are you a spy? Because a lot of people are wondering what you're doing here and if you are. And I, I asked him, you know, there's, there's no good way to answer that, by the way. No, <laughs> no is the only good answer, but uh, spy or not, I think that would be the answer. Uh, and so I asked him, what did he think? And he said, well, as, with as many people that think you're a spy, if you are one, you must be the stupidest spy because <laughs> so many people think that that's a possibility. So I don't know if I was just, uh, you know, sketchy in my time there asking too many questions or they just couldn't make sense of, you know, why someone would spend two years uh, in their village, in a, in a poor village, um, talking with them and asking questions and having conversations and, and learning about their lives because uh, they sure wouldn't choose uh, to be living in that poor environment if they didn't have to. Um, yeah. That's a lot of sense. Uh, I, I love that it was time that You're cutting out. I don't know if it's my connection or yours. I hope that is that it will abate itself. Um, 
but uh, yes, I, uh, I think we, we are getting close on time actually anyway, so maybe it's a, a foreboding warning from, from Zoom that wants to evict us immediately. <laughs> I did uh, uh, want to throw it over to, um, to Noor if you had any uh, last thoughts or, or comments before we, uh, before we thank Matt and, and thank sure, our, well, our audience. Uh, first of all, this has been a great discussion. I think, uh, again, Matt, your, uh, sharing your experience was wonderful. And Daniel, I think you've done a great, great job of taking the audience's questions. And I'm really happy that we had really good participation. Uh, and it's a lot of questions came in the chat box. I thought Dan, Daniel, you handled them, put them together and tossed them up to Matt very, very well. So I'm, I'm very, very happy. <laughs> Um, Mon, did, did you, uh, and it is, uh, usually we let these things run a few minutes over, so we're running into, um, we're about eight or nine minutes over, so it's time to wrap up. Mon, did you have a closing comment or two? Um, um, again, I, I just want to say thanks again to the presenters. It was great. And Mon, over to you. Yeah, so um, also thank Matt uh, for great insights and also sharing your stories in Bandung. And then again to Daniel for moderating such a great session. Um, just before we wrap up, uh, we actually would like to welcome you to join us for another webinar this Thursday on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, um, the trip pack that was just signed on November 15th. Um, I posted a link of that event in the chat box before, uh, at the beginning of the session. So um, do take a look and then we look forward to seeing you this Thursday and also in our future webinars. So great. thank you and uh, have a great night, everyone. Thanks so much, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Matt, Thanks, for joining Daniel. us. Yeah, enjoy great. the conversation. Such a pleasure. Good right. to see you all. Great. Thank you and good Thank you. To everyone. Bye-bye.